Is it good? So you start to, so you have Borchard and uh, Mobley on this side. So you have enough to start here? You need more than, you need one more? <coughs> Gene, can you hear me? I can. Uh, so I, I got a call from uh, a Steve Bennett just. To... Now I can't hear you. Oh, you can't? How's that? Okay. Any better? You're back now. Yeah, okay. Oh, again, to stay close to the mic. So uh, Steve Bennett called about an hour ago. He said if he comes to the closed session at all, Okay, Steve Bennett says. Well, we uh, have a quorum, so let me just start by calling the meeting to order. We'll call to order the July 22nd, 2020 regular meeting of the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency Board of Directors. Um, ask everyone to please rise wherever you are and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, with that, I'll ask Madam Clerk for a roll call. Chair West. Yes. Director Trembley. Here. Director Borchard. Here. All right, with that, thank you. We will recess this meeting until 1.30 and adjourn to closed session. You can, or I can try to turn up your mic. What number are you, Joe?
Director Mobley in a waiting room someplace? You seem to be missing him. I do not see him yet, Chair. Oh, wait, I do see him. Hold on. Thank you, Kaylee. You're welcome. All right, we have um, returned from closed session to, um, I guess, report that there was no action taken in closed session that needed to be reported in general session. We will uh, return to the general session now at item D, agenda review. Any changes to the agenda? None, Chair West. Thank you. We'll move on then to public comments. Anyone wishing to um, address the board on matters not otherwise on today's agenda, this is the opportunity to do so. Please, um, if you're on Zoom, I guess raise your hand or uh, give some indication to the clerk that you wish to be heard. Madam Clerk, is there anyone wishing to address the board at this time? No, Chair. Thank you. Moving on to board member comments. Any comments? by members of the board today. Uh, Jane, I have a comment. Yes, yes, Director Mobley, please. So I have some really good news to share with everyone. So the United Water Conservation District is planning on doing a major water release from Lake Piru starting on August 1st, that's August 1st. And that'll continue into November. We're expecting more than 20,000 acre feet of water will go through the Freeman diversion. And this is gonna mean that there'll be three full months of full pipelines for Pleasant Valley, the PTP and the Oxnard Wainini pipeline, as well as recharging the Fox Canyon aquifer and the shallow aquifers that, that continue to moderate the nitrate, nitrate levels in El Rio. So we're, there'll be a lot of Water running down in Santa Clara are pretty short, shortly. So uh, look forward to that. And 20,000 acre feet is a lot of water. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, moving on then to, co to the consent agenda, unless um, all we have on the consent agenda is the minutes of the last meeting. <clears throat> is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'd Someone? make that motion, Chair. And a second? Second. And we need a roll call. Chair West? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Mobley? Yes. Director Tremblay? Yes. Director Borcher? Yes. All right, moving on then to the regular agenda, item number six, authorization for an increase in legal audit services agreement. Chair West, this is uh, um, Jeff Pratt working for the agency. Uh, I think the letter speaks for itself. Uh, KPC went a little over the uh, 25,000 that I'm authorized um, and we're asking that you increase the contract. Your board authorized the increase the contract to about 34,000. Any questions or comments from the board on this item? Before we ask for a motion, any questions or comments from the public on this item? Okay, here, are there any, are there any, anyone with their hand up or any comments? No, Madam Chair. Clerk? All right. Is there a motion then to um, increase the, um, to authorize the executive officer to go ahead and execute the uh, agreement with KPC to increase the cost of the audit up to $34,000? I move. And a second? I'd second that, Chair. And the roll call. Chair West? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Mobley? Yes. Director Tremblay? Yes. Director Borchard? Yes. All right, thank you. Moving on then to item number seven. Uh, an update on the Nature Conservancy's Conservation Integra in Innovation Grant. Board 
Now you're Chair West, board members, Arnie Anselm, staff to the GMA. This item is an update on the agency's uh, NRCS grant through the Nature Conservancy and an amendment to extend the pilot water market through the 2020-2021 water year. Uh, three parts of this presentation are uh, uh, background on the Conservation Innovation Grant uh, and how it's being extended, an update on the current water market status and a proposed amendment to continue the water market pilot. Next slide. Thanks. The Conservation Innovation Grant is from the Natural Resources Conservation Services uh, to the Nature Conservancy. The agency, our agency, is a subaward to the Nature Conservancy. Matching is done through in-kind services and the grant has covered AMI, that's Advanced Metering Infrastructure Installation, the water market pilots, and is de uh, to develop the needs of a database structure to support a water market. Next slide. Mr. Chair, um, I can't see anything on my screen. Uh, so there, there are no, there is no PowerPoint up. So I, I'm not being, I'm not able to see any slides at this point. Yeah, the, the screen says that, uh, there we are. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, thank you. Uh, the grant initially was to expire in 2019. It was extended once through June 2020. The Nature Conservancy has received another and final one year extension through June 2021. Uh, funds will be used to support the water market. That includes participants' AMI data portal fees and to develop the data management needs. Um, and also new to this extension on the grant is the Nature Conservancy will reserve some funds to support their staff time. Uh, this is the final extension of the grant and the goal is not to leave any money on the table. Uh, the grant extension agreement will be brought back to your board after the scope of the data management system requirements is finalized. Next slide. Uh, apologies. Uh, so our current phase of the water market, phase two, 2019-2020, uh, participation was encouraged by additional funding incentive for the AMI installation. Those who committed to join the water market received an additional $500 to $1,000 funding for their AMI. And the allocation for water market participants uh, was updated this year to reflect more current farming practices. Uh, the agency notified uh, water market participants of what their water market allocation would be and it included it in the agreement with the exchange administrator. Um, but it's important to point out because IAI is flexible. The water market is a cap and trade system and we needed to have a separate allocation for the water market participants. Next slide. So participation in this year's water market is, is much higher than it has been in the past. We've got 29 com codes representing 77 wells in the Oxnard Basin. Um, it's the first time to include non-ranch AMI. That's AMI that wasn't funded by the grant. Um, and the question we get every time we present about the water market to the board is, uh, were there trades? Were there transfers and allocations? So yes, this year we've had um, 16 rounds of weekly trading. Eight com, eight com codes have actively participated with bids and offers. Six com codes have matched trades. A total of 146 acre feet has been traded at an average price of 330 $5.14, uh, so that's close to $50,000 has been exchanged on the water market. Uh, this slide shows uh, the trends and the market price history. Uh, the light blue line is the, the bid to purchase water. The, right, yes, and the white line is the offer to sell. Uh, the red dots are the average clearing price. Um, we have not had any successful mass matches since early June as the bids to purchase uh, water has, has tapered off. Uh, so the price of water has steadily dropped to an average price of $250 an acre foot now. There are currently 166 acre feet available on the water market. Next slide. Uh, this slide or this is really for illustrative purposes to show the value of the water on the market. Uh, we can't say that 
water purchases solely to avoid surcharges. But for comparison, you can see the difference in cost is substantial. 25 acre feet uh, on the water market is $6,250. And if you were to pay surcharges or if a grower were to pay surcharges on 25 acre feet, it'd be over $30,000 more. Um, and up into the $100,000 at the 100 acre foot and the total water market total water available, you can see substantial savings um, compared to surcharge rates. Next slide. So our plan is to continue the water market into the next water year, and that requires amending the ordinance. Um, nothing is proposed to change in the ordinance except for the dates, but there are a few differences. Um, this is the earliest we've been able to start the water market. And the allocations are also changing. This, uh, the allocations will be the same for water market participants as non-water market participants. And also reporting requirements under IAI is being removed. So amending the water market ordinance to extend it for one year was recommended by the operations committee on June 8th. And this is the action before your board today. Next slide. So apologies for not providing a red line strikeout version of the ordinance, but the, here's the summary of the changes. As I mentioned, it's a change in dates for the program period uh, to match the new water year of October 1st to September 30th. The change in allocation to match the allocation system adopted on October 23rd, 2019. And the change in the reporting uh, to delete the requirement for the IAI reports. Next slide. So staff's recommendation, recommended actions are to receive this presentation, read the ordinance in title only, find it exempt under CEQA and to adopt the, the ordinance. Happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Arnie. Questions from the board? Uh, hearing none, let me then ask, I'll uh, invite questions or comments from uh, the public. Anyone wishing to comment, raise your hand or submit a question and No comments. Madam Clerk, anyone wishing to comment? No comments, Chair. Okay, all right. At this point, is there a, um, I guess, a motion to approve the recommended action, including reading, reading the ordinance in title only and waiving further re uh, reading, finding the ordinance to be categor categorically exempt under um, California Water Code Section 10728.6 and California Environmental Quality Act Guidelines sections 10, I'm sorry, 15061 B3, 15301, 15303, 15306, 307, 308. Is there a motion for all that? This is Steve, I move it. Okay. Is there a second? Friendly second. We need a roll call. Chair West. Yes. Director Bennett. Yes. Director Mobley. Yes. Director Tremblay. Yes. Director Borchard. Yes. Do we, let's see, let me go back to my, all right, I guess a related item, item number eight is modifying the uh, water market pilot phase two exchange administrator agreement. Thank you, uh, Chair West. Once again, Arnie Anselm, staff for the agency. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation for this one, but it's a, a very quick item. So the water market phase two ordinance amendment just approved by your board requires a third party exchange administrator to provide services to support the water market. Um, the history of the water market is it was brought to the GMA from the growers group who wanted the flexibility to trade allocations. And one of their suggestions was a trade exchange should be managed by a third party administrator. The exchange administrator services include ensuring water is available for trade when offers to seller made 
that it protects against selling uh, a grower selling allocation into surcharges. Uh, they match bids and offers and set the clearing price, exchange the funds between successful traders, um, and uh, they report on market activity and inform the agency of allocation transfers. Uh, again, apologies for not providing a red line strikeout, but the modification is simply um, to the term of the agreement to match the need of the water market in the coming year. So it's just the dates are changed on this agreement through this modification. So again, happy to answer any questions on that. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, then any questions of, from the public on this item? No questions, Chair. Okay, then is there a motion to approve the modification? I move the recommendation. A second? Second. Steve, second. And a roll call, please. Chair West. Yes. Director Bennett. Yes. Director Mobley. Yes. Director Tremblay. Yes. Director Borcher. Yes. Thank you. Let's move on then to item number nine, an update on the development of a new interim allocation uh, system for the Las Cosas Valleys. Good afternoon, Chair West, members of the board. I'm Tim Loeb, uh, Fox Canyon staff. And uh, so this is an update on this uh, process for the new interim allocation system for Las Postas Valley. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint now. And you should be seeing that now. So, um, that's a lot of background on the slide, a lot of words on the slide, but uh, I think the, the point here is this has been a long process to get where we are now, starting in 2014 with the Las Postas Users Group, uh, beginning their work to uh, develop a new um, allocation system. And the LPUG entered into a Fox Canyon agency charter in April of 2016 to develop that new allocation system. And uh, there were many meetings, all, all their meetings were public meetings, many, many pe uh, public meetings through the development of that, number of presentations to your board, um, and an initial uh, white paper, they called it, uh, presentation to your board in December of 2016. Your board directed uh, staff to continue work with the ELPA group um, to develop an ordinance effective October 1st, 2017. And then um, revisions resulted in a June 2017 white paper and your board held a workshop and uh, went through that ordinance or not the ordinance, but the proposed uh, allocation method in detail. And that's when uh, the water, Las Postas um, Valley Water Rights Coalition uh, kind of splintered off and voiced opposition to that. Um, there were meetings back and forth. And then uh, the adjudication, of course, was filed in March 2018. And further development was put on hold after that date until um, your board at your October 1st, 2020 meeting uh, directed that uh, it was your goal to enact new allocation ordinances in all the basins uh, by October 1st, 2020. And uh, staff came to your board at the January 2020 meeting and uh, brought your board up to date. Your board uh, directed staff to develop a new ordinance based on the uh, white paper and uh, some of the terms that were in the stipulated agreement between the parties that came out of a court mediation process. And then yesterday, uh, staff conducted a workshop 
Zoom workshop on the Las Cosas Valley interim allocation and went through the details. And we'll go through some of those today uh, and walk you through and also um, relay a few of the, uh, the comments that we heard yesterday. So the new ordinance would replace the allocations in emergency ordinance E and the agency ordinance code. And it would be an interim allocation ordinance until such time as the court does complete its adjudication of the water rights in the basin. And it would be based on that June 16, 2017 LPUG groundwater pumping allocation system white paper. And some of the breakdowns and allocations would be uh, based on that stipulated agreement. Allocations would be assigned to wells as they have traditionally been in um, Fox Canyon Ordinance Code and as they are um, in the white paper. And um, operators can continue to combine extraction facilities within the basin, but probably uh, with some exceptions uh, would need to be limited to management areas under this ordinance system. Um, these are some of the key elements. We will we'll go through them um, a little bit more. Uh, they're divided into management areas, and then there are allocation pools within each management area. There's a method for assigning the initial allocations to the wells. Now, the white paper did uh, contemplate a methodology for allocation reductions. Um, Staff not proposing that those reductions be included in the interim ordinance as it is interim. Um, of course, your board reserving uh, the right to uh, consider reductions if needed for the basin in the future. Allocation carryover was something that um, the white paper uh, identified as desirable but did not develop uh, a methodology and so we're proposing that be based on the methodology that's included in the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley allocation ordinance that your board uh, approved. There'd be some additional reporting requirements. Uh, there'd be allocation transfers would be allowed uh, with some limitations. The white paper talked about stored water of course, these would be um, addressed in resolutions and agreements and nothing in the ordinance would um, prohibit the, the storage of water subject to those agreements. All similarly with the water market, um, the white paper talked about the water market being uh, a part of the ordinance system. It's not included in the interim ordinance itself although there's nothing in the ordinance that would preclude a water market, it should be pointed out that in the Oxnard pilot program that your um, board just uh, heard about and uh, voted to continue on, um, that is a separate ordinance. It's not part of that OPD allocation ordinance. So this is similar to that or parallel. Uh, there's a variance process and there, there could be a variance review committee as well, similar to what's in the OPD allocation. Um, the three management areas identified in the white paper and, and also defined in the groundwater sustainability plan are the West Las Posas and East Las Posas management areas and the Epworth Gravels management area, which is the sub area within the East Las Posas. This uh, figure shows the East and West separated by the Selmus Fault um, here, I think you guys can see my cursor there, and uh, which is a barrier to fl water flow between the two management areas. And then the Epworth Gravels management area is the area, the extent of the Epworth Gravels aquifer, which is um, above and hydraulically disconnected from the underlying Fox Canyon and um, Grimes Canyon aquifers, and it's its own management area. The white paper and proposed ordinance identify two pools in each of the east and west Las Posas management areas. 
And that's based on the Ventura County Waterworks District wells and all the other wells we operate in the basin. So in the East Los Posas, the pool one would be all the operators extracting in the East Los Posas, except for the Ventura County Waterworks District wells or uh, district number one and wells of district 19 that are in the East Los Posas and those in the Epworth gravel management area. And then the pool two would be the Ventura County Waterworks District wells in the East Las Posas. Similarly, in the West Las Posas, pool one are all operators extracting the West Las Posas except for the Ventura County Waterworks District number 19. And pool two are the Ventura County Waterworks District number 19 wells extracting in the West Las Posas. And then the Appworth Gravels Management Area Pool are those operators extracting from the Appworth Gravels Aquifer. So from the stipulated agreement, it uh, divided, allocated the amounts of uh, extraction in the basin and in each of the management areas and the pools within the management areas and um, identified 36,000 acre feet for the basin as a whole divided into 21,600 21, acre feet a year in the East Las Posas and 14,400 in the West Las Posas. And those are further divided into the pool one, which was 87.41% of the East Las Posas pool, which you can see is 18,881 acre feet. And that includes the Epworth Gravels Management Area that uh, would be a subset of that allocation. And then the Waterworks District would be 2,719 acre feet. And in West Las Posas, the pool one would be 12,688 acre feet and pool two 1,712 acre feet. The white paper identified something they called unexercised right set aside, which we're calling reserve allocation pools. And the idea of the reserve allocation pools are that there are undeveloped lands within the East and West Las Posas management areas that could be developed into irrigated agriculture. Uh, the OPUG did an analysis of those areas to identify the number of acres um, and then uh, they came up with an allocation in the white paper of 670 acre feet a year in East and 320 acre feet a year in the West Las Posas. So the initial allocations for the pool one, so this is all the operators um, other than the waterworks districts in the three management areas would be decided based on the greater of the annual average extraction in the 2009 through 2013 base period or the extractions in 2015 or the minimum allocations to the pool one operators, which we'll talk about in a moment. And this would establish the pro rata share of each well of the total pool allocation in their respective pools. So for agricultural operators, the minimum allocations are defined as the cumulative share of the pool one allocation divided by the total irrigated acreage in the East Las Posas, excluding the Epworth Gravels management area. And the total irrigated acreage should be based on the reported 2014-2015 II application. And similarly for the West Las Posas, it would be the cumulative share of all the pool one allocation divided by the total irrigated acreage in the West Las Posas. Um, we did have not calculated out what those are yet. Um, so that's something that was a question at yesterday's workshop. Um, so we're working on uh, coming up with those amounts. 
Domestic operators, minimum allocation is defined as two acre feet per parcel. There were concerns about that amount um, voiced, um, but the domestic operators, um, at least presently, are a sub percentile of the extractions in the basin. And then other operators, um, essentially M&I operators, their minimum allocation would be the temporary extraction allocation or TEA established for that operator under emergency ordinance E. So as I mentioned, there are reserve allocation pools established in the East and West Las Posas. And those are established, the lands um, developed within the basin as uh, irrigated agriculture after the base period. It would, the reserve allocation would be limited to water in the reserve pools in each of the management areas and would be set to an amount equal to the minimum allocation in that management area. Priorities were established in the white paper for um, assigning reserve allocation with the first priority being for any new wells um, new or increased water use for a well that did not exist prior to the end of the base period. And then second priority um, for well permits that were issued after the base period that have, have not been installed yet. Third priority are for allocations for well permits that were approved after the base period for water use that existed during the base period and then a fourth priority for allocations for new or increased water use served by a well with an existing allocation. And there is a, a process, a defined process for applying for these and then a 10 year uh, demonstration requirement that the groundwater has been continuously put to beneficial use. Pardon me as I take a drink here. So um, as I mentioned, the white paper identified allocation carryover as an important feature, did not develop a methodology. We're proposing to use the same methodology adopted by your board in the OPV allocation ordinance. And the way that works is an operator may carry over up to 50% of their um, yeah, there was a question about the way I stated this yesterday. So basically it's up to 50% of their annual allocation um, that's unused. So if they had a hundred acre feet of allocation and they pumped 50, they could carry over 50 acre feet. And they can accrue up to 100% of their current annual year allocation to carry over into the next year. The first water used in any year is deemed an exercise of that carried over water and the carried over allocation expires after five years. And then for um, accounting clarity, the annual allocation carryover for extraction facilities are combined into a single COM code are evenly divided at the end of the water year into the combined extraction facilities, for example, if there are four wells in a comp code and 100 acre feet is carried over, then that would be divided into 25 acre feet of carryover for each one of those wells. Um, and then if, presuming that comp code did not change, that would just be pooled again into the next reporting period. So in terms of reporting, in addition to the reporting currently required by the ordinance code um, and uh, AMI monthly reporting, we would have additional reporting requirements. Um, we base those on the requirements in the OPV allocation ordinance and many of them uh, parallel the requirements already in ordinance E and also are those in the white paper. And it requires annual reporting of monthly water supply by parcel for ag operators and ag water purveyors and uh, to the list of parcels provided 
by domestic and m and operators and water purveyors providing m and and water, uh, water to those, uh, for those purposes. Um, there was uh, a question about that. Was there a need for that? Um, and so that's something uh, your board can weigh in on. Allocation transfers, uh, temporary or permanent assignments uh, may be, of allocation may be approved by the agency. However, allocation cannot be transferred for use outside of the basin or from one management area to another. There is a provision that operators with wells in more than one management area may transfer allocation between those commonly operated wells in a given water year, provided that any extractions in excess of that operator's allocation be transferred or made up in the following water year. Uh, as I mentioned, stored water, um, and nothing in the ordinance will prohibit the agency from approving agreements for water storage and withdrawal in the basin. Uh, there's a variance process that uh, was developed uh, by agency staff uh, with LPUG for the white paper, um, which allows uh, an owner operator to request a variance to initial allocation or minimum allocation. Of course, if it's an operator, requires uh, the approval and consent of the owner. But the sole purpose of the variance is to enable the owner operator to make reasonable use of the groundwater in the same manner as other users in the management area. And there are a series of um, findings that the burden of proof is on that applicant to uh, present. And uh, that's very similar to our current variance process and, and similar to the one in the OPD allocation ordinance. So as you know, your board uh, established a variance review committee um, by resolution for the OPV ordinance and appointed a, a variance review committee to review certain types of variance allocation applications, I mean. And so it, it would probably be appropriate to establish a similar committee for the Las Posas Valley Basin. So that is sort of a quick run through of the elements of uh, what will be in the um, proposed interim allocation ordinance based on the LPUG white paper um, and, and informed by the, uh, the stipulated agreement. And so uh, our, uh, I just want to, oh, I didn't put plan forward. So, um, to keep with uh, your board's uh, previous uh, goal of an October 1st implementation timeframe, uh, we have a very aggressive schedule. Uh, to achieve that, we would need to bring this to your October um, board meet on October, August 26th board meeting um, in order to adopt the ordinance because the ordinance would go into effect 31 days after the adoption. Thank you, Kim. A couple of couple of questions. I know yesterday's workshop, there were a lot of questions about the feasibility of the implementation of this particular program by October 1st, particularly given that the data has not yet been circulated with respect to what the allocations would be to each of the affected stakeholders. Um, uh, I guess that was, a, that was a principal concern of mine after listening to, to the presentation yesterday. Um, I guess, what options do we have if we, if, or have staff considered if we look beyond October 1st? Well, Chair West, um, and uh, let's see. Okay, my screen stopped sharing. Um, and uh, well, that would be up to, to your board. Uh, there, you could consider, um, and something that had been considered previously, um, 
at past deadlines, there's a, a January 1st implementation date. Um, and we could find a way of uh, addressing that interim period as we have already for moving into the water year. And so um, that might be an appropriate um, fallback um, because indeed it is, a, a, it is going to be um, um, a quick time frame to get adopted for the October 1st implementation. Well, you know, apart from the, I mean, I, as sensitive as I am to the amount of work that it adds on your desk and to the board, the, it does seem to me to be a large burden to put on stakeholders who don't yet know what their allocations are and who will have a, a, uh, an increasingly shorter amount of time to submit variance requests and get them acted on. It just, just doesn't seem as if there's time enough between now and October. That was just my observation. <laughs> you have any thoughts on that or? or? Um, well, I would, we, we uh, if your board so directs, we would work uh, diligently to provide those that information in the next couple of weeks and, uh, um, and as well as develop a draft of the proposed ordinance. Uh, certainly there would be a short time frame for uh, processing variance requirements ahead of the October 1st uh, deadline. I, uh, uh, for the start of it, implementation, um, I, I suppose uh, um, it's open to discussion as to whether that would be an absolute ne uh, necessitated requirement to have them completely processed by the time of the start of wa um, water year. How does the process, or I guess, what, how, how does the process work with stakeholders having, uh, I guess, a choice between one of those three base periods or allocation methods? How do you how do you reach the final numbers, and when when in this timetable does that happen? Um, well, Chair West, my understanding of the process and the intent of the white paper is it's not a choice, it's whichever is the greater. So the greater extractions of those three is in fact the allocation. And then of course that sums to the numerator of the distribution of all the allocations. And, and is that analysis ready? I mean, is that analysis available? That analysis is not available yet. Those are all the questions I have. Any other questions from the board before we turn it over to the public? Um, Mr. Chair, I had a question on the carryover allocations expiring after five years. Uh, Kim, assume the following hypothetical. Assume that you have six years of a carried over uh, allocation. In year six, does the year one carryover allocation, is it eliminated? Um, In other words, yes. is, is it a rolling five-year carryover? Yes, Director Tremblay, it is a rolling five-year uh, carryover. And uh, I will point out that as was discussed uh, during the OPV allocation uh, board hearings, uh, in practice, as long as the, that well is being used uh, regularly, because the first extractions are presumed to be the um, carried over allocation. That's the first, uh, first extractions. Then in practice, that five-year period is somewhat mooted. If that makes sense. That makes sense. And good, good thing it's only a hypothetical. Then. Hmm. Yeah, the only, time, the only time you'd likely run into, I guess, losing a carryover would seem to be if somebody was following a lot of land for a long period of time. Correct. So, any other questions from the board before we open it up to the public? All right, thank you then. Um, members of the public, if you have questions or comments, this would be an opportunity. Please raise your hand, alert the clerk of the board that you wanna be heard. And Madam Clerk, let us know when you're ready. None seen, Chair West. Hmm. 
Okay. Um, I guess if there are no questions or comments, we'll come back to the board. The this this is um, staff asking for direction. Um, I just have a hard time, as my questions probably indicated, seeing that this gets accomplished and that the, and the public gets um, in, informed and prepared to to, to um, implement this by by October first. I, I, it seems to me that a January first implementation for Las Posas, um, given the timing, would be. Would be more appropriate still be a lot of work to get done but but it would give people a little more breathing room particularly since we don't yet have the information available to be able to tell folks what their allocation is starting october 1st chair west yes so are you suggesting that las posas have an implementation of january 1 and oxnard Sub basin stay at uh, October one. Yeah, we're only talking about Las Posas. I wasn't talking about changing anything having to do with Oxnard. I was talking only about about Las Posas because the the all the prep work that notifies the folks in the Oxnard basin about what their allocations are and what the variance process is that's already started. That's well underway. That information's out there. We're just beginning that that process for Las Posas. So I was only suggesting January 1st with respect to Las Posas. So if I could, I'd just like to ask staff, are, could, could I always like to hear the advantages and disadvantages of any option here. So I've, sure. I've heard some advantages. What would be staff, can you offer what you see as potential disadvantages of us going to January 1st for Las Posas only? So, um, I would say it, for disadvantage, it's now um, out of sync at least for three months from the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. Um, and so we have to carry over um, another three month uh, transition period allocation that we'll have to come up with. Um, I, I, that's really the, the principal disadvantage I see. We would transit, if we did, if your board did choose uh, January 1st, start state we would have um, then a, I suppose a nine month uh, first year reporting period under that then to sync up into the water year. And they would stay on IA, IAIA for the three months period? Um, they could either stay on IAI or uh, perhaps uh, uh, some kind of transition implementation um, as your uh, board uh, selected for the, the two and three month transition for Oxnard and Pleasant Valley, um, either way would uh, could come up with a, uh, a reasonable methodology for that. Do you feel it's a, do you feel we could appropriately implement on October 1? I assume you do because that's what your staff recommendation is, correct? Uh, my staff recommendations consistent with your past board um, uh, direction. Uh, I do think that it we will we would be able to provide the materials and the uh, the, the draft ordinance. Um, you know, in a few weeks with uh, plenty of time ahead of the August um, board meeting. However, um, it would provide a single reading of that ordinance. Um, and uh, we, we have, um, there were concerns expressed at the workshop yesterday about the time frame. So I'll, I'll be uh, frank about that. Subsequent to you writing up your staff recommendation, have you had any change of uh, opinion as to what you think is uh, the appropriate recommendation? Um, <laughs> I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm, I'm quite frankly, I just want to make sure I'm not overlooking anything. Right. I think it would be entirely reasonable for your board to make the decision to implement the, uh, this ordinance effective January 1st of 2021, based on what we know right now. 
based on what you know now, you don't think it's a you don't think that that causes any significant problems for for Fox, the Fox Canyon groundwater agency. I don't think it causes us any problems, and I believe that it will um, cause less consternation amongst the stakeholders. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Let me ask. Let me ask this: since the the subject, how do other board members feel about a January one implementation? I I agree. I think the biggest hurdle, as Kim mentioned, would be we would have to come up with some transition allocation system, whether it's continuing the status quo for a few months or doing what we did with with the Oxnard plus the Valley basins, where there was a short term allocation system before the adoption of, of a new allocation system. I mean, that would be a hurdle. That's something we'd have to work out fairly quickly. Anybody have any thoughts? Chairman so, West, I, I do have a question if I could, uh, both for you and for County Council. Um, uh, Alberto, does, does, does it cause any legal issues for us if we hold to October 1 for one basin and go to January 1 for another? What are your thoughts on that, uh, Chair West? And then I'll ask County Council. I don't know of any, but I'll defer to Alberto. Alberto? Uh, no legal issues. It would just be a matter of crafting ordinance language that uh, accounts for the transition period. Do we have to justify that one's on a different track than the other? I, I, I'm sorry, I, the, the audio wasn't. Do we, do, we, do we have to justify that one is on a different track than the other? Excuse me. The only justification that would be needed would be that there wasn't sufficient time to implement uh, with an October 1 start date and that in order to, for example, to quantify uh, the allocations under the new system that uh, the January 1 date would be more appropriate. Is, is Mr. Uh... Shepard or Mr. Pratt, are you listening in uh, at this point in time? We are. Do, do, do you do you have any uh, any uh, thoughts about January one causing any uh, significant impacts for the agency? Well, it, it, while the agency will see some uh, um, administrative impacts. Um, uh, <laughs> I, my, my question is on the GSP. I can't remember what we told them in the GSP um, and whether or not we'll, we'll have an annual report coming up, uh, probably due uh, sometime around April, May of next year, as I recall. And in that, we're going to have to report on what was accomplished. And so there may be some uh, uh, apologizing going on for not meeting schedules, but I have to go back and look at the GSP. Kim may know more about that. Do, do, do you think it's viable for us to implement by uh, October 1? Um, I think it's tight, but then everything we do seems to get pushed back to the last minute. Um, uh, and uh, the hope was that with uh, this ordinance, because there had been so many years of work in it, that that wouldn't be as big of a problem. Um, understanding that there's still some issues to work out, the um, ramp down and so forth, but um, uh, it's doable to get it done in October from if you're asking my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman West. By all means. By all means. Anyone else? I, I think uh, October 1st is worth going for. I'm, I mean, we would have to... Um, like appoint a variance committee next next month, so uh, you know the variances are not going to get dealt with, or won't be finished most likely with October by October first. But I don't think that's really a a deal breaker. Just like I don't think a lot of, I think there's still going to be a lot of um, variance requests un, unfinished with with OPV, but I don't think that matters 
Um, so I, I think, I mean, I, I think we should just shoot for October 1st and, and let staff um, cry uncle at our next meeting and say they can't do it. But let's, let's keep the pressure on and see if we can keep with the October 1st date. I think it's worth going for that way we're in sync with, with the other basins. Thank you, Michael. Anybody else? Chair, I could share a little bit. Um, being in sync sounds tidy and, and makes a lot of sense organizationally, I suppose. Um, perhaps an extenuating circumstance in the Las Posas basins is there's a lot of, of allocation being delivered via mutuals. And to the, to the extent that those mutuals are then able to get those allocations out to their individual growers is another bit of, uh, it's just gonna take them time. Um, if, if the intent would be to push for October 1, then it would be really incumbent upon staff to get those figures out immediately because there's going to be, uh, it's going to have to be digested uh, on a grower by grower, uh, landowner by landowner basis. And it's gonna take a while for some landowners to actually get that information. Chair? Yes. For the reasons that uh, Director Borcher just articulated, I, I would favor January 1. Well, I guess let's, if, um... Why don't we ask staff to work up the numbers, work up the ordinance, bring it back to us at the August meeting. And if by then um, the timing is a problem or the public has an opportunity to review the ordinance and wants to discuss that changing the implementation date in an ordinance, we can, we can discuss it in that context rather than just um, in a, uh, in a vacuum, so to speak. Um, and this way, if we if we'll have an ordinance, hopefully um, that we're ready to implement and we'll have more input input from the stakeholders about whether or not they can implement that, you know, if we adopt it. And it won't Chair slow West. us down. It won't slow us down at all. Chair West? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, uh, that approach, which uh, preserves the option of uh, October 1 and yet still lets us have that conversation. Um, I would uh, like to suggest that we add to that motion uh, the direction that uh, uh, Mr. Borchard mentioned, which is to direct staff to immediately uh, work on getting the information out so that uh, if we can at least get that information so pe people, we, we have an opportunity to stay on track. Uh, so if we could add that to it, and then we have another conversation um, that uh, I could support that motion. Yeah. Okay, we're just giving direction to staff. I think that would be a that addition would make sense as well. It give uh, may say it kind of burdens staff in the next month to get a bunch of things accomplished. But if, if that gets done, maybe we do stay on track. If that can't get done, then we have a different conversation. All right. Just just to further quantify the the time we're looking at here. As I'm looking at my calendar, we're five weeks out from the next meeting. And so I'm thinking that that information needs to get in to people's hands, gosh, no later than a couple of weeks away, and ideally in one week away. Because as I said, it's going to have to be digested. People look at their own operations, do the math, see what that allocation actually looks like on a per acre basis before they can be ready to comment at our next August meeting. My, my understanding is that Kim guaranteed he'd have this out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that too. You're right. <laughs> well, if it was tomorrow, then I think I could support the motion. <laughs> well, again, we don't have a motion. We're just, just giving staff direction. And I think we've given them plenty to do. So Kim, any, anything else that you need from us? Any questions that, that you had that you'd like us to answer before you proceed? Uh, no, I think the, the direction is clear. Staff will uh, endeavor to get those um, uh, allocations, proposed allocations out as soon as possible, certainly uh, no more than two weeks. And uh, we may, uh, it, it may be worth proposing a, 
a special meeting earlier in August, if that might make sense in order to uh, consider some uh, the stakeholder input and if we have the draft ordinance available. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll map out the time frame and uh, I'll put that on council in terms of the time frame for the ordinance. And that might be something that would be worth uh, looking at. Kim, the, are you considering another uh, workshop uh, with respect to the Las Costas allocation plan? I know yesterday's was attended by about 55 people online. Um, I don't know if you were contemplating doing another one, but there may be, knowing that this is coming down the, the pike very quickly, there might even be more people interested and it might be helpful. Um, yes, it, I know that people, uh, stakeholders really uh, were interested in seeing the draft allocation or ordinance language. Um, and, uh, and of course seeing, it always comes down to what is, uh, what is my individual allocation gonna be? Um, and so uh, that it, uh, if there seems to be uh, interest in that, we're more than happy to hold another workshop to uh, work through that and talk about that. And Kim, I would add that uh, perhaps in your mailing or however you're going to communicate individual allocations, you also include the variance form or how people might uh, contest or question what they're being uh, given. Because that's gonna be probably a part of of your decision to us in August as to whether you think you can implement in August based on how many people have said, hey, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Director Borchard, I, I would suggest that maybe that be an intent to file a variance because it would be uh, a little cart ahead of the horse to have a variance filing before there's an ordinance in your board. Fair enough, but you'd still want to have an idea of, of how many people actually uh, oppose what they're given. Okay, very good, we can do that. Anything else? All right, let's move on then to item number 10, the GSP update. I'm sorry, GSP workshop implementation. Chair West, members of the board, again, for the record, Kim Loeb, Fox Canyon staff. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint here. You should be seeing my screen now. Um, and so this is an update on uh, implementation, the work plan to implement the GSPs. Uh, of course, the GSPs for uh, the three basins were adopted by your board in December and submitted to DWR. As we've talked about, uh, those GSPs include the estimates of sustainable yield based on the best available science in the projects that were um, developed far enough along to meet the GSP uh, feasibility criteria and selected through a board operations committee process. But um, we, your board staff do that. In fact, the GSPs themselves do talk about the need for basin optimization studies and evaluation of other projects following adoption of the G, oops, there's a, that should be a little less GSPs um, to uh, project out how we're going to get to sustainable management of the basins in the next 20 years. So we uh, first brought this to your board in at the January meeting and we talked about various items that um, are in the work plan or need to be, it could be considered as part of the work plan um, and what the prioritization of those are. And your board prioritized uh, four items. Bold indicates the prioritization as your board uh, directed at that January meeting and that's the basin optimization studies, project feasibility analysis, um, moving forward with the new data management system and formation of an advisory committee. And so uh, we're going to uh, 
the purpose of this uh, item is to update your board on the progress we have to work plan forward. And we plan for this to be a regular update to your board as we move forward with implementing the GSP. So in terms of the advisory committee, uh, an advisory committee has been formed through the DWR funded facilitation process for the LPV basins. And uh, Gina Bartlett um, with the Consensus Building Institute gave an update to your board at the June meeting. And since then, uh, there have been two um, core stakeholder group is the facilitations calling it meetings on June 25th and July 16th convened by the facilitator. In terms of basin optimization studies, um, your board had talked about getting uh, stakeholder input on that. An agency and United staff uh, made a pre presentation and had a discussion on basin optimization studies with that OPV core stakeholder group at its July 16th meeting um, and received a, a lot of good feedback. Uh, we will be working on developing optimization scenarios, including uh, different horizontal and vertical distributions of pumping. Um, and many of these optimization projects or scenarios will require evaluation ultimately as projects because if we do distribute pumping, then pipeline infrastructure or new wells or other types of uh, um, infrastructure would be needed to, um, to help redistribute the water to meet the demand. Staff will continue working with the OPV core stakeholder group to develop those optimization scenarios and then report back to your board on them with the proposed scenarios uh, ultimately um, to be modeled using the, the GSP baseline by uh, United. Project feasibility analysis, um, you know, we've talked, the stakeholders have talked much about the need for the various different kinds of projects that would be needed to um, meet the sustainable management in 20 years with minimizing the amount of pumping reductions that ultimately will be needed to get there. Um, as we just mentioned, there will be infrastructure projects identified through the basin optimization and other potential projects. Uh, some of them uh, you know, are, are fairly well known potential projects, but there may be others, um, including water supply or mitigation projects such as um, seawater intrusion barrier type projects. Staff will report to your board uh, and, and request your board to provide direction on identifying projects to then move forward with feasibility analyses, including order of magnitude costing and implementation timeframes that can go into the process ultimately of uh, determining what mix of projects and optimization will be the most cost uh, effective method of moving forward with the sustainable groundwater management. And we'll need to engage an engineering consultant to conduct the feasibility analyses um, and cost estimates. Uh, the two new data management system, we talk a lot about that all the time. Uh, your board uh, has, has directed that as a uh, priority. Uh, we know that we need to move to a GIS-based system, the transfer to a land-based allocation system and OPV. But we also need to uh, have a system that will directly incorporate the AMI, um, accommodate the water market, et cetera. As you heard from Arnie earlier, the, um, the grant through NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service, through as a subgrantee, through the Nature Conservancy is providing some funds and we budgeted 136,000 in the budget that your board approved for the coming year for development of the requirements. And we are working to 
put together the scope of that uh, solicitation and uh, hire a uh, specialty consultant to develop the requirements analysis and uh, document what will be needed in the next new data management system so we can move forward with um, procuring and developing that. Data gaps are a constant thing that we will be working towards filling. Um, as you know, there were new monitoring well uh, clusters installed in the Oxnard Subbasin and Pleasant Valley Basin through the DWR Technical Services Support Grant Program. These will both fill very important data gaps, both laterally in the basin and vertically with screens uh, completed each aquifer. Uh, DWR is just now completing development of the Oxnard wells that was delayed due to the uh, COVID pandemic. And we're, we're presently collecting uh, groundwater samples from those uh, quality samples from those wells. Um, options for addressing other data gaps need to be identified, including cost estimates to help prioritize that. Um, and that will be part of the new consultant contract scope. So um, as we've also talked about, uh, due to approved scope, uh, the agency has uh, talked, always represented that post GSP is the time to uh, let a new contract for consulting services for implementation. Staff is working on that RFP to uh, hire a qualified consultant, including to help uh, do project feasibility analyses and data gap analysis and cost estimation. estimation. Um, and, uh, and prepare the annual reports that have to be submitted to um, DWR. And uh, staff is already bringing that new consultant on board uh, this fall. Financial considerations was another piece. Uh, the work plan budget that your board approved includes $440,000 for GSP implementation in this uh, coming fiscal year that may be used for technical studies, including project feasibility analyses and data gap analysis or other tasks that your board may direct. Um, you know, ultimately, significantly more funds will be needed, of course, but the budget amount will uh, certainly um, provide the, the funding to begin studies necessary for GSP implementation. And uh, the new technical consultant will be tasked with developing cost estimates for, for the various GSP implementation tasks to provide your board with the information for directing prioritization of that. Um, replenishment fees is a, a constant theme uh, identified by stakeholders in the board, your board and the GSPs ultimately to fund those projects. Um, as we've talked about, those will be subject to Prop 218 and 26. And so we need to have detailed reports on those project costs and benefits before replenishment fee can be adopted. And the identification of the projects and the feasibility analyses in those cost uh, estimates will help to work towards providing that information that will be needed to move forward in that arena. So the timeline, um, both far and near term, um, we have to achieve sustainable groundwater management by January of 2040, 20-year period. So projects need to be evaluated, designed, permitted, funded, and implemented well before 2040 so that they can be up and running uh, and demonstrating, uh, well, not demonstrating, achieving sustainable yield by that 2040 date. Uh, the updates to the GSPs need to be completed and submitted to, Jan to DWR by January 2025 and be uh, earlier than that, uh, but Sigma and the GSP re regulations say they have to be reviewed and updated as needed, a minimum every five years. And then in terms of the near term, 
staff's recommending that um, uh, goals of uh, conducting optimization studies uh, this year, if possible, we'll have to coordinate with the availability of United staff timeframe for uh, modeling and project, the initial project feasibility analyses during the first part of 2021 things on track. So that is uh, my report. Uh, we recommend you continue to file a report and provide any uh, direction on uh, continuing uh, work plan development and implementation. Thank you, Kim. Is there a, um, I guess with, with <laughs> we probably have to get beyond all of this allocation business before we get to start talking about base and optimization studies and hiring consultants, but did you have a, when you, when you, when the meeting started, did you have a timeline in mind, at least with respect to those elements? Well, I think those elements can be run uh, concurrently uh, to some degree. And our, uh, our goal is to have the, get the RFP out there solicitation and have a new consultant on board um, by this fall. And then uh, the optimization studies to the extent possible um, to uh, conduct those this calendar year. Again, that's going to be require coordination um, with the modeling effort, um, but that's the goal at this time. And then uh, the uh, first part of next year, start working on those uh, feasibility analysis for the projects that are identified, at least initial. That, that'll be both the base and optimization and the project feasibility would be somewhat of an iterative process, but we can get the initial um, phases of those uh, two items underway. Sure. Any other questions from members of the board? Thank you. Any questions or comments from the public on this item? No questions. Not hearing any. Thank you. This is a receive and file. We'll do that. Move on to the executive officer's report. Is there a motion to receive and file the executive officer's report? So moved. And a second. Second. Bennett. We need a roll call, unfortunately, because everything's on Zoom. You've got to have a roll call. Chair West. Yes. Director Bennett. Yes. Director Mobley. Yes. Director Tremblay. Yes. Director Borchard. Yes. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.